Australian art therapy is a creative industry undergoing major change. In one of the most radical shifts in government policy for generations, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or NDIS, has provided increased access to supports and services for hundreds of thousands of Australians. This is redefining what Australian art therapy is, who it might serve, and how it can best do so. There are around 4.3 million Australians who have disability, and the NDIS is the first national scheme to provide funding directly to the people it serves. It was introduced in response to the Australian Government's 2011 Disability Care and Support Inquiry, which found that the existing disability support system was underfunded, unfair, fragmented and inefficient. Historically, disability organisations could apply to the government for grants, which they then used to fund services. The Disability Care and Support Inquiry report recommended that instead, funds should be paid directly to the individual. In this way, the participant is put more in the driver's seat of choosing the organisations and people that suit them best. This reflects two of the core values of the NDIS, choice and control. Eligibility for receiving NDIS funding centres around age, nationality, the need for support due to a permanent and significant disability, and this can be either from birth or acquired, the use of special equipment such as a mobility or communication aid, and the potential for current supports to reduce future need. NDIS plans attach funding to certain categories of support, and the category which art therapy may be charged against is number 15, known as capacity building for improved daily living. The impacts of the NDIS have been major and far-reaching, and today I'm exploring how the practice of art therapy has been affected. I'm interested in this issue both as a trainee art therapist and as an Australian, because I do hope to one day um, practice as a qualified art therapist back in my home country, uh, and I want to be as best prepared as possible to serve my communities. Um, I also have more uh, specific links to this issue in that um, working in disability services has been a really important part of my career so far, and that has been uh, both before and after the rollout of the NDIS. Um, in particular, um, I work with Interact Arts, which is an accessible art studio in Australia. Uh, Melbourne has been um, a really influential part of my professional development and my journey to become an art therapist. In my research, I've found that Australian art therapy has been impacted by the NDIS in multiple ways, broadly categorised into three groups. Career pathways, the intersubjective complexity of working with families and carers, and the implications of report writing. To help me understand these issues better, I'm joined by Carla Van La, an experienced Australian art therapist and co-author of the paper, The Balancing Act, Performing Stories of Our Practice Within the Systems of the State, which explores how art therapists might find a way to effectively and authentically work with and within the context of the NDIS. Carla lives and works on Boon Wurrung country in southeastern Australia, Aboriginal land which was never ceded, and she and I both pay our deep respects to the first people and traditional custodians of this land. So to begin with, Carla will speak about the impacts of the NDIS which she has noticed in her work as a supervisor for arts therapists. Although the NDIS has increased and broadened the potential client base for art therapy, it seems this creates challenges relating to the career pathways of newly graduated therapists. Yeah, it's made a really big difference to... Um, the ways in which arts therapists work. So when I first started out um, qualifying, I think I finished my degree, my master's in the year 2000, and I went into a sequence of full-time jobs within organisations. So working within the youth justice system and youth mental health, hospital work, um, and that kind of thing. And that kind of pathway is becoming, um, from my perspective, less and less common so, yeah, more and more art therapists aren't actually having what I might think of as, um, you know, almost an apprenticeship or, you know, when you're newly qualified that you work within an interdisciplinary team where there's experienced clinicians that you have access to and, you know, you have the support of an institution and all of their guidelines and rules around you, but also you have them as a backup and you have on-site supervision and debriefing, all of those things that help or helped me develop in my early years. Um, 
So I think a lot of art therapists are going straight out into practice without all of that support and without all of that experience. So that's what I then see or come across in supervision that art therapists are, you know, trying their best to find their way and navigate through this quite complex system without having had the initiation into systems that you get when you have a full-time job. As a trainee approaching my graduation, this point about the um, potential for isolation really resonates with me uh, because I have experience of the value of working in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, however, it does seem that the arts therapies are particularly well positioned to address this challenge. Australian arts therapists are able to address the issue of professional isolation, not only through the clinical supervision required by ANZA Carter, the Australian, New Zealand and Asian Creative Arts Therapies Association, but also through new, innovative imaginings of what continuing professional development might look like through programs like the Creative Mental Health Forum, which Carla delivers annually to bring arts therapists together for experiential learning, self-care, connection and a sense of community. In addition to the impact on career pathways, working within the NDIS requires practitioners to adapt to the intersubjective complexity of managing therapeutic relationships which must often take place within shared spaces, and which are often under the scrutiny of carers, family members and case managers. Through the NGOs, a lot more people do outreach art therapy, so actually go to people's homes and work with them in their own home, for example. Um, and there's also, um, in that context, there's often family members and carers around. And so art therapists are not only having to, um, well, arts therapists, in my experience, generally work hard to try and meet the needs of the person that they're working with. But there's also these other, you know, people in the sphere who might have different expectations or might be, you know, very outcomes focused. And so art therapists are juggling these multiple relationships around the person that they're actually working with as well. Carla elaborates on this point in her paper, um, describing the tension between the need to maintain confidentiality and therapeutic containment for her client and the request of her client's father, who manages her funds and her transport to and from therapy, to stay informed about what happens in the sessions. Lastly, Carla describes how the reports which the NDIA require art therapists to write in order for participants to secure continuing funding are inherently at odds with some of the values which underpin art therapy. The challenge of the NDIS itself um, and the way it's structured and the, um, you know, the way that funding is granted and the kind of um, reporting that people are expected to do. And they're the things I think, those kinds of things that Alison and I wrote about in our paper, which we called the Balancing Act, because it really is a balancing act. What we talked about, um, performing stories of our practice within systems of the state. And so we sort of um, raise the idea that, well, the, the reports that we write, yes, they have the function of um, helping a person to secure funding for the services that art therapists provide, but they also, you know, become a narrative or a story that's performed about that person. And it's, you know, really quite um easy if you like to maybe slip into writing from a deficit perspective with the intention of you know securing the funding for the service okay so it might serve that function but what's the bigger impact of telling stories of deficit over and over about a person throughout their life this reiteration and formalization of power dynamics through report writing links with Linnell's concept of the expert, responsibilised art therapist and the vulnerable and needy client. An over-reliance on reports is incongruent with art therapy's valuing of ambiguity through making, viewing and thinking about images. Ren Arvis has recently written about this phenomenon in her blog about her experience of the NHS mental health services in the UK and refers to it as the curse of the paper self. Both Ren and Carla advise a move towards co-production in report and note writing as a possible way to increase accuracy and decrease the potential for harm. Indeed, the NDIA website also advises for a move towards co-production, 
but it will take the ongoing work of everyone involved to implement best practices. As a cursory glance at Australian newspapers will show, many NDIS participants have experiences far removed from the ideals of choice, control and co-production. These experiences vary from the frustration of dealing with the red tape of a new system to heart-wrenching stories of criminal abuse and neglect. It's important to acknowledge that in making this video, I have recreated problematic elements of the organisational dynamics at play at the NDIA, in that I have centred my voice as a non-disabled person whilst talking about disability issues. Ideally, Australian art therapists will begin to disrupt these parallel processes by moving towards a more truly person-centred approach and privileging the voices of service users and art therapists with disability. I hope to have taken small steps towards that today by citing sources written by advocates with disability. Ultimately, the NDIS raises both opportunities and challenges for Australian art therapy in the areas of career pathways, intersubjective complexity of working with carers, and the implications of report writing. And if art therapists can engage with these issues and find creative solutions to challenges, it offers opportunities for some of Australia's most marginalised groups to access the benefits of art therapy.